I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Uh, will I be able blessing to, to be here it all? this morning. Um, it's... Uh, <coughs> Even though it was uh, planned, I knew about um, this morning that I'd be covering for pastor for uh, a while now. Uh, it's, it still amazes me every time God does it, uh, how much he can, um, how many times, how many times he can change my mind for me. Um, <laughs> I originally thought, okay. Well, this has been laid on my heart. This is what it's going to be. Uh, this is what uh, I'm going to prepare. And then I get that maybe halfway through, and then God says, "Oh, no, no, no. You just maybe it's just that I needed to learn whatever I had already, whatever I had studied." And uh, and He changed my mind for me again. And then this is the result of the third time. <laughs> um, that he uh, changed, you could say he changed my mind for me. What we're going to be looking at tonight, or tonight, yeah, um, I'm used to speaking at the evening service. What we're going to be looking at this morning is about how God blesses a heart of integrity. Um, this, uh, this world that we live in right now is one that is obsessed obsessed with appearance. Uh, if you are beautiful, if you are really smart, if you have a flashy car, it, no matter what it is, <coughs> you are if you are one of those, you are considered to be the best in this world. The Bible shows us, however, that our outward appearance at least to God, does not matter whatsoever. And for some of us, that's a good thing. <laughs> I know I put myself right in that category that, uh, you know, I am not, uh, how can I put it? I'm not, you could say, great at any particular thing. I learned uh, many years ago um, or a number of years back, I worked with an older gentleman, and the day I met him, the first day I met him and was working with him, he asked me, what are you going to teach me today, Nate? I go, you just barely learned my name. <laughs> what are you talking about me teaching you? You're probably, he was probably three times my age, at least three times my age at that point. Um, and, and I, I just, I had this, such a confused look on my face, I'm sure. And I said, what do you mean? I'm learning from you. And he goes, and he went and said, Nate, if I can teach you anything, the one thing I'm going to teach you is, does not matter your age, does not matter how much you know, always remember you can learn something from anybody. And... Um, that has, so far anyways, served me very well. And um, it has especially, in uh, serving here in this church, especially the past couple of years, that is approaching, um, especially the Word of God, with, with the knowledge that I know, um, I know very little about it. 
And you know what? God has truly revealed that to me in uh, many different instances, especially recently. Um, I know I've mentioned it in evening service. I'm not sure if I've mentioned it at all um, in opening and morning service at all. But going through characters of the Bible, you know, even we started right out. First one, Adam. Okay? Adam is going to be easy. I know about that. Well, you know what? There was so little I knew about him. Once God started, the Holy Spirit started revealing things and showing me things, things that um, at points seemed very insignificant and yet were so very important, it turns out, in the grand scheme of things. Just remember, though, that our image does not concern God. He focuses on our heart. Um, Shane, can you give me 1 Samuel 16 and 7, please? But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature. That is talking the outward. Okay? Don't look about at uh, how handsome he may be. Don't look about how muscular or how smart this person is. Why? Because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We, um, uh, several or a few times here, we have, uh, I have shared with you different things from the Sermon on the Mount um, and being the Beatitudes. Um, and we are going to, we're actually continuing with that um, this morning. As I had mentioned, I, uh, I had other things that I thought the Lord had wanted me to share instead. But no, he wanted me to continue with this. So Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart. Now, in today's society, in today's world, uh, when you are talking about humanity, when you're talking about people, and the word pure comes up, um, obviously the, the first thing or the main place that people tend to go, their thoughts tend to go, they think of pure, they think of it in a sexual manner. Well, you know what? This is not necessarily what it is speaking about here. This pure in heart. What exactly does pure in heart mean? That's the first thing we need to look at, okay? What does that pure in heart mean? It is talking about integrity. Also meaning blameless. And now, it does not mean perfect or sinless, okay? If, uh, if you had to be perfect, if you had to be sinless, you could not make mistakes to be, to be able to have integrity, what would that mean? Not a single one of us would be able to have integrity whatsoever. So obviously, drawing from the, the scripture here, the first thing that we can know for this is the fact that since it is here, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, means, well, it's, it's attainable. It is attainable to be able to be pure in heart, to have integrity. God is more interested in your heart direction than your sins. A good example of this, for you to understand what I am talking about, uh, one very well-known person in the Bible, King David. Okay, King David. Uh, God used the uh, uh, the analogy, or said that he was a man after my own heart. But what is some? What is a very popular um, account that a lot of people know about King David? His uh, first was um, his uh, <clears throat> uh, adultery. And then what did he follow that up with? 
murder. The woman's husband, he sent, he, um, sent him to the front lines where he knew that he would end up being killed. So looking at that, I mean, that are, those are some, in our eyes, those are some pretty horrible, awful sins. And yet, God still said David was a man after his own heart, after God's own heart. So then looking at the next part, what does it mean by they shall see God? So we re you can read other places in the Bible where it says no man can look on at God. No man can actually look at God the Father. So what does it mean we shall see him? This is not talking about seeing as in visual with our eyes. It is talk still talking on the heart. It's talking about that relationship. Those who are pure in heart will be the closest to God. They will have the closest relationship with him. They see him for who he truly is. And they get to experience the extent uh, of his power, love, and even God's purpose for their life. And these are the ones who, when God sees them, he says, they're my friend. I don't know about you, but that is something that uh, I want God to be able to say about me. To say, Nate there, he's my friend. He has a pure heart. Now, does this mean that um, you will, uh, you'll never trip up? No, because once again, we all trip up. What is tripping up? It's sinning. We are going to do it. However, we need to not let that interfere with, uh, with our relationship with him. So now I want to look a little bit closer at what integrity or pure in heart, what integrity truly is. Um, there's three main things here of what integrity, integrity is. First of all, it is a wholeness. Okay? Now what this means is we are not segmenting our life. As in, we don't have um, uh, this part of my life, that's work. This is home. This part is church. This part is my uh, relationship with God. This part is with my friends. In all these different parts. Now I'm not talking about, I want to make sure to mention, I'm not talking about um, the thought process of um, not bringing home troubles and worries, say at work, not bringing them home with you. Okay, That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, what I am talking about is how you act in each of those. How you act across the board. Looking at segmenting, a good picture of it would be um, before the Titanic was built. The, uh, the way the ship's hull was made, it was one big open Compartment. So, in other words, if they hit a rock, if they hit a, uh, if they hit an iceberg, whatever, okay, they get a hole uh, in, in the hull. It was filled with water. The ship would sink. The Titanic was the first of its kind to uh, where they segmented the hull. It was full of individual compartments. The thought process behind that was is that if they hit an iceberg, if they hit a rock, something happened where there was a leak, that section would fill up with water, but none of the others would. So it would keep them afloat. It would not sink. Now, of course, the reason why um, the Titanic sank was they, uh, the iceberg they hit, of course, ripped through multiple of those, toward the, uh, those segments. But looking at that and using that, um, 
that picture is one where we are not compartmentalizing, that is actually a word, our life. Okay? Now, integrity comes from the word integer, actually. For anybody who knows anything about math, integer is talking about the whole number. So integrity comes talking about our whole life. How do we act? Do, when, our, when we are with our friends, are we acting the same way with our friends as we act in church? Or the way that we do at work? How are we acting during those times? Integrity is looking at our life as a whole. So what is integrity? Authenticity. Meaning you are keeping it real. You're not trying to be someone you're not. What is the biggest thing, or the, uh, one of the biggest things, uh, worst things about a lie? Can't remember it. Trying to remember it. Wait, okay, this person, okay, this person is calling me. Uh, 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 what did I tell them about that? If you just tell the truth, you know what? You'll have no problem remembering it. In uh, Greek plays back during um, uh, like Aristotle, um, Homer, the Iliad, all those things, all back during that time, they would, at different times, they would have um, a person, an actor, who would have multiple masks. And back then, what this person's position was called was Kupokritos. You might say, oh, that word sounds kind of familiar. That's where we get the word hypocrite. What their job as an actor would be is they would, pray, uh, they would play multiple parts. What they would do is they would come out with one mask, and they would play that part of that person, of that character. They go back behind a screen or whatever, change out, grab a different mask, come out. And that's how they did it. It means multiple faces. That is what, that is like where, what I said, where we get the word hypocrite. Okay? How, uh, how you act in front of different people or in different parts of your life. Reputation is how you look in public, meaning when, pe when people are watching. <coughs> Integrity is how you act when you're alone with God, meaning uh, no one can see how you are acting or what you're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. And what is integrity? It is unmixed motivation, meaning you do the right thing for the right reason. <coughs> uh, Shane, can you pull up uh, um, our opening reading, please? Psalm 15. I want to read this another once more. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. <coughs> He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. This is talking about a man or a woman having a heart of integrity, doing what is right at all times. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Remember it? Yeah. Pastor has a little stash of <coughs> mints. Pastor, if you're watching, I'm stealing one of your mints. <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> I'm borrowing. <laughs> uh, 
Integrity is what you do when no one else is looking. Proverbs 11, 20, please. Oh, actually, you know what? That's one I gave uh, the wrong one to Patty, so hold on. And I will turn that. That is my fault. I realize after the fact. <clears throat> Proverbs 11, 20 says, They that are, are of a froward heart are an abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. Those that are of a froward heart are an abomination to the Lord. Now as we continue on, Okay, those are the three things of what is integrity. So, now I want to talk about um, <clears throat> three blessings that come from being a person of integrity. I'll try and get through these as quickly as I can. First off is uh, personal confidence. Um, shake it out of Proverbs 10, 9, please. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. Wait a second, that sounds awful familiar, isn't it? To uh, that other verse we just read, too. And how about uh, Proverbs 11, 3? The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. What are we looking up at here? What is one of the blessings that come from being a person of integrity? Personal confidence, for one. Okay? Um, if you're always true, it's easier to be confident. And you tend to be the person that people like to be around. Why? They know they can trust you. And you know, it also coming with that personal confidence by being a person of integrity, it's easier to see God's plan for your life as well. A second blessing that comes from being a person of integrity, and this can come with uh, uh, last month celebrating Mother's Day, and then this month, uh, today, celebrating Father's Day, is a lasting legacy. When you think of a that term, a lasting legacy, continuing on, um, in your life, through the generations, that legacy. This does not mean that say, okay, I am, I'll use myself as, as an example, because I know me pretty well. Um, I am one that likes to work with my hands, okay? I like to fix things. Cassie says I have too many tools. Um, and uh, that's something I like to do. A lasting legacy is not talking about that uh, Derek or Penelope will continue on in the exact same thing that I like to do, okay? Even though uh, Penelope is, uh, as far as I know, still saying that she wants to be a diesel mechanic. She wants to work on the big trucks uh, and drive a what color. And have a red motorcycle. <laughs> uh, I, I said, "Good luck with that." Uh, you're gonna have to move out before that's gonna happen because uh, if Cassie, if Mama won't let Daddy have a motorcycle, she's not gonna let you have one. But anyways, uh, <laughs> that lasting legacy is talking about how they work. <coughs> Are they honest? Are they hard worker? Those good qualities. Does it pass on? That's what a lasting legacy is. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. What does that mean when I am looking at myself? If I am a man of integrity, if my, in all areas of my life, my children are watching me. So what does that mean? If I have integrity in all areas of my life, you know what? It is a very high probability that my children 
will have the same. If we are people of integrity, it will be seen in generations to come. And also, Job decided, um, without going into that, into the whole story, he decided to be a man of integrity in his faith to God. And because of it, in the end, he was doubly blessed. The third blessing, rewards in eternity. This is something Pastor has spoke on uh, quite a bit fairly recently. Matthew 25, 21, please. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Another thing that we can look at here, we can know we have to be careful, we have to be careful changing certain things, okay, changing things um, in the Bible. However, I do want to make one little thing here. Instead of saying a few things and many things, we can also change that to little things and big things. So what is that saying? You've been faithful in the little things. If you have, since you have been faithful in those little things that I have given you, you know what? I will make you a ruler over the big things. That comes with our blessings as well. We'll see that in the blessings. This is the best blessing out of these three that I have shared. Why? It's eternal. It's not something that uh, is only, uh, we can say, seen here on earth. It is one um, that goes on, goes on into eternity. It is not the big things in life that show true integrity. It is in those little areas, those small things. Your small, right decisions will be rewarded in eternity. And that is what we are seeing here in this verse. Okay, so you are now saying, okay, Nate, so uh, we, I know now what pure heart or what integrity is. I know blessings of that. But uh, can you give me some examples of how to become a person of integrity? Well, I have a few here for you. First of all, uh, Proverbs 25, 14, please. By long forbearing is a prince... Oh, did she put in... Uh, that was supposed to be verse 14. Can you yeah. give me 14, please? Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Okay. Nate, what in the world does that mean? What does that have to do with integrity? The first thing, how to become a person of integrity? Keep your promises. This here, whoso boasted himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Don't be that person that goes and will constantly say things that you will do things and then not do them. It is likened here as clouds and wind without rain. Not a whole lot of purpose to them without that rain. A, um, a you know, broken promises are the number one cause of bitterness in children. A, uh, I heard a, an example given that was actually a very good example to this morning. There was a pastor that was supposed to go uh, and speak at a large uh, group, very large. I mean, I'm talking in the tens of thousands of men. And this group of men all from all over the United States was called the Promise Keeper. Okay? These were men of integrity. And uh, this pastor had told his son, had given his son the promise of, 
um, if you want to go to this Christian camp, this the, the, the his son was uh, scared of going by himself. He said, "I will go with you. I promise you that." Well, his son said, "No, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going." And uh, so instead, he booked this during that same time when he was supposed to go with his son. Well, it came down to uh, the last final days of when you could uh, register for this camp, which was just before this huge uh, speaking engagement he had, and his son changed his mind. Well, he said what he did was he kept his promise to his son by breaking his promise to speak to promise keepers. He said it was a very difficult decision to make. However, what he what he looked at was the fact of that first promise. What his son would see in him, he wanted his son to see integrity. And uh, looking at that, we need to keep promises, even when circumstances may change. Um, Let's see, can you uh, pull up the, sorry, uh, Shane, Psalm 15 again? 15. They can't work this morning. Psalm 15, uh, yeah. the 1 through 5. There it is, okay. I just want to pull out one little piece here. Verse 4, the second half. He that sweareth to his own hurt, as talking about keeping a promise, okay, a promise. He, so he that promises to his own hurt and changes not. Okay, so first thing, how to become a person of integrity? Keep your promises. Second thing, this uh, might be a little bit of a sore subject. Pay your bills. Okay, Nate. Where is that coming in? This is a form of financial integrity. Uh, Psalm 37, 21, please. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. So if you are one that uh, has credit cards, or has loans, and you are defaulting on those, according to this uh, verse here, you are, uh, you are being called wicked. To be a person of integrity, we need, you need to uh, make sure to keep up with those. Those are promises that you made, okay? Those are contracts that you made, you said you would do, we need to hold up to it. And under the paying your bills as well, um, we have don't defraud the government of taxes. Ooh, another sore subject, right? Guess what? This one's in the Bible too. Matthew 22, 21. They say unto him, Caesars, this is Jesus uh, talking to them about uh, the money. Then saith he unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Render therefore unto Caesar the things, the things which are Caesar's, unto God the things that are God's. This is talking about taxes. Those things that the government says you need to pay. He's saying, God is telling us, this is Jesus, God the Son himself, speaking, saying, you need to pay what uh, the government says you are supposed to pay. Ooh, here's a juicy one. The third thing of how to become a person of integrity. Refusing to gossip. This is relational integrity. This is <coughs> one of those things where you are talking to somebody. You are so friendly, so nice to their face. Keith, oh, you're awesome. You're doing a great job. He's telling me things. He's telling me things in confidence. 
because he feels he can trust me. And then once he's gone, I go running over. Hey, Steve. Oh, you won't believe what Keith just told me. Oh, gosh. Oh, this is a juicy tidbit. <laughs> Don't be a gossip. There is now there is a fine line between gossip and counsel. Meaning, somebody comes to you in confidence. They are looking for, they have questions about whatever. And maybe you don't have the answers to that. You need to go to somebody else, okay, for that. It is a fine line. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a fine line between what gossip is and counsel. Um, for that, Proverbs 11, 13, please. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. This is talking about gossiping. You know, one of the worst and best things ever created is social media. It can be a best thing. In the sense of, it is much easier nowadays to connect with old friends. To be able to find people, to be able to reconnect, to be able to possibly find family. So it, it, it has its good points. But unfortunately, it is one of the worst things ever created because of the amount of gossip that is so easily shared through it. It used to be there were essentially two ways, face-to-face -face or picking up the phone and calling. Those were the two main ways. Now, you don't even have to talk to somebody. Because then also, what was it? That gossip could end quickly, okay? If I went, um, if I went to Dale, okay, he's a man, let's say, okay, he's a man of integrity, I go to him, and gossip, you know, tell him all these juicy tidbits, and he's just like, I'm not gossiping. I'm ending it right here. I'm not going to share that. Okay? So it could end there. Now, with social media, people doesn't even have to go through, let's just say Messenger, okay, through a private message. They can post it, and depending on how it is, it could be all their friends, it could be public can see this. This juicy gossip. Proverbs 10:18. He that hideth hatred with his lying, with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. You know, when it comes to it, I want God to know me as friend, not as a fool, not as the wicked. Okay, so we talk about one sensitive subject, and then uh, uh, then we talked about a you could say a juicy one. Now this one, this next one, <laughs> is an even more sensitive subject. How to become a person of integrity? Keeping your promises, paying your bills, refusing to gossip, faithfully tithing. Ooh, boy, Nate. Yeah, you had to bring that up. Yes, I did. This is also a form of financial integrity as well. You know, it used to be that I would hear, I've heard this phrase throughout my whole life. I have, most of my life, grown up in church. I've heard the phrase, I can't afford to not tithe. And I never truly understood that. And by understood, I mean I never experienced it, so I just couldn't grasp that because I think about, or at least the way my brain works, I can't speak for anybody else's, I want to look at, okay, this is how much money I bring home, uh, this is how much money I make, these are my bills. My bills in this world, okay? And as we looked at before, we are supposed to be 
paying our bills to be <coughs> people of integrity. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, okay, so when I pay all the bills, there's nothing left over. It doesn't make sense to give money to God first. You know, there's plenty of other people in the church, right? Oh, there's plenty of other people in the church to, uh, that have more money than me. They can do it. They can tithe. You know, that'll keep the church afloat. Well, you know, it was, Cassie and I have seen this, especially in the past, uh, oh, few years, couple few years, um, we decided to adopt that, uh, that mentality, that phrase, that we can't afford not to tie. And I will tell you this, it has gotten to the point now where if, you know, say we just forget to, because we don't, um, we don't have checks anymore, so if we have forgotten, because of whatever, busy life, we have forgotten to get the cash out, to be able to put the offering plate, it bugs me the whole week until the next Sunday. And I have to do it. I've got to get the money in there. It bothers me. It bugs me like you would not believe. <clears throat> Having this mentality, we have also seen that not only is, um, not only with tithing, giving to God what is His first, when He asks of us, giving that money first, we also are not only having our needs met, but we see blessing so much more. Uh, can you give me the, uh, let's see, Malachi 3, 8 through 10, please. <coughs> Will a man rob God, <coughs> yet ye have robbed me? But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in the houses, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. What is he, what is being said here? You tithe, you give of these, what's going to happen? Not only will your storehouses be full, that is talking about your needs being met, okay? Your bills will be paid. You will have food in the fridge. You will have uh, food in the cupboards. You don't have to worry about being old Mother Hubbard without uh, any food for a dog, okay? You don't have to worry about that. Oh. And beyond that, by the way, I will give you, and I'll pour you out a blessing, there shall not be enough room to receive it. You won't be able to comprehend or understand exactly the amount of blessings. You will look at these blessings and go, what did I do to, be, to uh, qualify, if you want to put it, for this blessing? And that is faithfully tithing. Wherever you put your money first is what is most important to you. We, um, I don't think that I gave it, because I don't even have it in my notes, so I don't think I gave it uh, uh, to Shane. You don't have Matthew 6, right? Get it. No, okay, so uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, let's see, verse, verse 21 is what I'm looking at. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then you skip down to verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is talking about money. So, you, so you're like, oh, well, wait a second. You're talking about uh, the love of money, serving. Well, wait a second. 
if you are putting God first in every area of your life, that's talking about financially as well. That money. Now that does not mean necessarily, okay, that, wait a second, I get paid on Friday. That means I can't spend any money whatsoever until I give on Sunday. It means when you are drawing up your budget, you are looking at your bills, okay? You are saying, okay, here's, here's the money I got. First thing, this is God's money. That money is reserved for him. Then you look at the rest. You, uh, we need to be, to be persons, people of integrity. We need to be faithful in our tithing. We need to give God his uh, first. The fifth thing, ooh, I got to be finishing up here. Uh, fifth thing, um, this can be uh, also a uh, sensitive subject, doing your best at work. And this is talking about um, not just doing the minimum. What is required of you? Okay, it's talking about going that extra mile, as well as um, not goofing around a lot in the sense of, oh, everybody else is doing it. What a picture it would be, and what a testimony it would be to Christianity, okay, and to God, if all Christians in this world were to adopt this thought into their life that they would always go the extra mile. They would work because they know that even if the boss can't see me, the big boss can see me. And they work with that thought, with that, that thought process. Imagine what that would turn into. Might have companies going and saying, oh, I only want to, I only want to hire Christians. Why? Because I know they're going to work hard. What a testimony of Christianity that would be. God considers it a serious thing when you get paid for a full day's work, and yet you don't work the whole day. What would happen if all Christians worked with integrity? Oh, let's look at Ephesians 6, 5 and 6, please. Servants, this is talking about workers, okay? Be obedient to them that are your masters, meaning your employers, your managers, according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with thy service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So you're supposed to be doing this, fear and trembling and singleness of of your heart, that's not compartmentalizing it, okay? As unto Christ, that is saying, that is looking at to a point, I don't care what my human manager um, is seeing me do. What's important is what God sees me doing. And let's skip to the last thing here. Okay, so you have keeping your promises paying your bills, refusing to gossip, faithfully tithing, doing your best at work. Then the sixth thing, being real with others. We spoke on this a little bit earlier. Okay? You don't fake it. You don't lie. You aren't a hypocrite. Second Corinthians 4, 1 to 2, please. Therefore, see, we have this ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And the not walking in craftiness, craftiness is not talking about uh, George, okay, being crafty with wood and being able to create beautiful things. It's not talking about that. This craftiness is talking about being sly, being uh, uh, a liar, tricking people. Be real with others. Be that one where what you see, 
is what you get. How in this world can I keep it real? We need to care more about what God thinks, not what others think. One last verse, please. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed, or paying attention to, thereto according to thy word. So how in this world can I keep it real? How, it, how is it that I can become a person of integrity? Right here, it says right there. By taking heed, paying attention to, studying, obeying the word. What you see right here. This is the way God is. What you see is what you get. You open the word, you know you're going to get truth. If you follow this in every part of your life, you can know that uh, you are a person of integrity. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much this morning, Lord, for these uh, for the wonderful messages, Lord, that you have for us in your word. And Lord, I pray for not uh, for not just all those uh, all the other people here or watching, Lord, but also myself this morning. Lord, I just pray that as um, as we look at these things of how to become a person of integrity, Lord, there are so many other things. These are just a few that were shared this morning. But as we look at these, may we examine ourselves this morning and see maybe it's uh, maybe we have been faithful in tithing and paying our bills. We are ones that keep promises, but maybe maybe the place where we tend to fall short. Is that work? Lord, uh, when people are getting together, people are uh, fooling around, joking around, just standing around talking, we join them just because that's what the crowd is doing. Lord, I just pray that no matter what it is where we uh, might be failing, Lord, I pray that uh, we all here this morning, Lord, would adopt these Lord, that we would take these, remember them, we would apply them to our lives. Lord, that we would, uh, Lord, that we would all have this desire, Lord, to be called a man or a woman after your own heart. We would be looking forward to and striving to be able to hear those words one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Lord, I just ask your blessing on these people this morning. What it will and on Sunday school we follow. In Jesus' name. When I walk Amen. By your side, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by